So we have a uh, stacked webinar. Um, we want to use our time as wisely as possible. So I'm going to jump right in um, and introduce Jerry. Jerry Green is a veteran civic engagement professional and US Census expert. As a consultant to the National Urban League, Jerry directs the organization's policy and strategic approach to ensuring an accurate count of African Americans and historically undercounted communities. In this role, she has convened 2020 census workshops around the country, bringing together philanthropy, local and state elected officials, grassroots advocates, faith-based leaders, and census officials. Previously, Jerry was the Senior Advisor for Civic Engagement to the, US, to the Office of the U.S. Census Director. Before this role, she served as Chief Office of External Engagement with the U.S. Census Bureau, where she educated national stakeholders on the benefits of census participation and engaged historically undercounted communities of color on challenges and obstacles to obtaining an accurate count. I cannot imagine a better uh, speaker for today's webinar. Um, so thank you so much, Jerry, and uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and thank you for inviting me to participate in Nonprofit Votes webinar on the 2020 Census. You know, um, first we'll talk a little bit about the National Urban League's uh, 2020 Census outreach efforts. I'll talk briefly about why the census is a priority for the Urban League, some of the activities we've been involved in and such, um, communities we've engaged and resources we have on tap to help our constituents. Finally, I will share some of our messaging, which we have tweaked, and it's required some tweaking over the course of the last few weeks uh, leading up to the census, which is now upon us, and hopefully most of us will get uh, our census forms in, our, in the mailbox today. So moving on to the next slide. Why is the census important to the National Urban League? Well, the Urban League was founded in 1910. Um, it was established as a nonpartisan civil rights organization dedicated to the economic empowerment of African Americans and now to a more broader uh, network of constituents, brown and black primarily, to um, further the economic goals, home ownership, jobs creation, and all those things. Um, we conduct our work through a network of 90 affiliates across 36 states in the District of Columbia, serving 2 million people each year. So the census has been a big deal for the National Urban League for decades. 50 years ago in 1970, uh, uh, the for a former Urban League Executive Director, Whitney Young, Jr., testified before Congress about the need for a full and complete count of Black and underserved communities in the 1970 census. And some of the concerns raised back then, which I think you'll find very familiar, are like, oh, was this 50 years ago? And that is, the, the, there was a, he called, talked about an inadequate assistance for completing census forms. Uh, he testified about poor community outreach a lack of Spanish language forms. This is 50 years ago, the National Urban League was, was advocating for Spanish language forms. Um, he talked about inadequate community outreach, which we, we now know is called the partnership program. He talked about misplaced communication between, now this is real interesting, mis, I'm sorry, um, communication from the Census Bureau, which unfairly shifted the blame for a potentially large undercount of African Americans to a hostile Black community on the heels of the civil rights movement and lingering tensions following Dr. King's assassination. So those were the challenges that back then. If we can fast forward to 2020, you see a lot of parallels and even greater challenges affecting um, the, the Black count and communities of color in general. The bottom line is, is that the census is a game changer. It's about money about a trillion dollars in federal funding each year to states, local governments, and households a year. It's about representation, as we all know. Um, I'm talking to the choir here about the, how census data is allocated, uh, helps allocate and determine the seats in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College, based, are all both based on census data and power. Communities are empowered by their vote and full representation of the political process. 
They're empowered by the enforcement of civil and voting rights laws and housing laws, all that are based on census data. So because of these issues affecting representation, power, resources, and democracy, the National Urban League continues to be a strong advocate for an accurate count in the Centennial Census. So if you see that black power fist that we have on our make black count materials and all, that, that is a retro fist. That was the fist that was used 50 years ago. There was a Make Black Count initiative 50 years ago, and we just reprised that fist and um, brought it up, and it's still relevant today. And if we can go uh, on to the next slide. It, it, okay, very well. So who's at risk? Who's most impacted? Um, well, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's pretty much the same picture decade after decade for, for the Black population. Last decade in 2010, uh, the Black population had a net undercount of 2.4%, or 800,000 undercounted individuals. Now, another measurement of the undercount that the Census Bureau does not really publicize is called the omission rate. This is the raw number. It's not the net count where you subtract this, you subtract overcounts from undercounts and all that. This is the net, I mean, I'm sorry, the raw number of how many people were downright missed in the census um, by, by race and ethnicity. For African Americans, about 4 million people were actually omitted from the census. And that is before the net undercount is actually cal calculated. So you see there are lots of challenges. Um, so the 2020 census brings new challenges for an accurate count, some we've never experienced. And here are a few. Seven out of 10 black children between the ages of zero to four years old were missed in the 2020, 2010 census. And that goes for Hispanic children as well. Young Hispanic children were missed at about seven, more than seven out of 10 uh, children were missed. African-American men continue to be missed in staggering numbers, almost at every age group. The mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex contribute to a staggering number of formerly incarcerated men and women, disproportionately black and brown, who re-enter our communities across the country each year to the tune of about 700,000. So it's a challenge. We're gonna, we have to garner this population's trust and they must be counted as well, especially since they're not counted in their communities when they are incarcerated. The digital divide, as we all know, this is the first internet based decennial where everyone in the population will have a chance to go online. We're concerned about the digital divide and low digital fluency. You know, I was at a, um, speaking at a church event a couple of weeks ago, saying, go, go online, you know, the census is easy, go on, and this dear lady stopped me and she said, what, when you say go online, what exactly do you mean? And I thought, oh my goodness, where do I begin to say what going online means? You know, I can't talk about user words, passwords, um, but so digital fluency is really, really something that's going to be needed. Of course, Black immigrants who fear the government or are indifferent about the census uh, are a growing segment of the Black population, and they're growing at a faster rate than native-born African Americans. So we have to include and talk about Black immigrants. Um, college students, this is for all of us, college students living off campus, highly risk, a uh, high risk population, of course, the homeless. Now, a couple of things that are new. We certainly anticipate and have seen already disinformation campaigns, bad actors. This is across the board. This, this goes for all of us who are, who are um, putting things out there, but particularly within communities of color to sow seeds of fear and distrust about the census and to thwart the count in our communities. And finally, something I hear a lot about when I go speaking to groups and communities is, the, is, the, is gentrification and displaced Black communities and how this is a growing, it's kind of a simmering undercurrent of distrust out there as it relates to the intentions of, of the government. The next slide, please. So what do we do? We meet people where they are. The National Urban League has conducted workshops and outreach all over the country to educate our community about the importance of the census. We've collaborated with Philanthropy, uh, United Way, the Annie Casey Kids Count um, um, 
organization, local and state officials, elected officials, grassroots organizations, and the Census Bureau. Um, as an example, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we had a meeting with Black clergy and Head Start administrators to talk about the undercount of young Black children and what we can do about it. We've had national teletown hall events. Last October, we had one where we invited the public to join us on a call uh, with civil rights organizations and leaders. And uh, Stacey Abrams, who has founded Fair Count down in Georgia, was our, our featured speaker. Two days ago, we held our second teletown hall. Um, Martin Luther King III was the featured speaker, and we thought we should bring in mayors from all over the country to talk about what the census means to their communities and how they're getting the word out. Um, we've had, we, at that last call, we had more than 3,000 people RSVP, and over 1,200 callers stayed on the line to the very end, which was two hours later. Uh, the National Urban League has developed a, a 2020 Census Black Roundtable, which is comprised of national civil rights leaders, Black immigrant organizations, Black fraternities and sororities, clergy, you name it, to, so that we can align our messaging and strategies for an accurate count. Um, we are engaging Black immigrants through organizations like the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and the Institute for Caribbean Studies, who are both roundtable meetings. Plus, the National Urban League sits on the Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee, where we have advocated for the inclusion of Black immigrants in the 2020 Census Communications Campaign. So we're very pleased that there's Haitian Creole as one of the languages uh, that they'll be providing assistance um, in helping to get the forms completed and um, um, many other um, things that we've seen manifest as a result of this advocacy. And finally, last but not least, our 90 Urban League affiliates are our most trusted voices. They're all over the country and serve underserved and historically and have been serving these populations uh, nationwide. And so they have, they are mobilizing for an accurate count as well. Um, moving on to the next yes slide. So what are the resources? I'll go through this very quickly. We've developed a toolkit. Caitlin, I'm happy to give you that. Um, we developed a toolkit. There's so many toolkits and resources out there for, you know, uh, stakeholders. We have a Make Black Count website that you can go to and find resources. On that website, you'll find social media messaging and promotion, promotional tools that you can use to um, tailor your messages to your community and constituents. Um, we are convening, we are not convening, we have the Congressional Black Caucus has convened a 2020 Census Task Force. Congressman Stephen Horsford is a chair of the Congressional Black Caucus's 2020 Census Task Force. And he's been having hearings and talking with um, the National Urban League and other groups to find out what's going on in our communities and what are, we, what are our needs with respect to an accurate count. On March 23rd through 29th, we are having um, a Black, Black Census Week where all of our organizations are going to be doing any number of things to get out the Black count. And um, as I said, um, the civil rights organizations have been working um, in unity uh, and, and are, have aligned our 2020 census priorities. So almost coming to the conclusion here about messaging. So, you know, previously for all these, for the past couple of years, almost, well, I'll say, yeah, almost two years, uh, maybe a year and a half, we've been focusing on educating the public. There's such a need out there for, because people really don't understand the census, you know. Um, the other thing that we've been doing now, though, we're moving beyond, okay, what is the census? Because the commercials are out there now. And now we're focusing on execution. What do you have to do? Now, we're not saying just do it, but we are saying it's, th it's that time. It's time. You have to, you have, we have to move. We have to get this count in. So we're pushing people to, to uh, understand that the census is safe and to get, get, it, get, it, get it done. Um, we're also telling people that the internet response, we have to say over and over that the internet response is just one of four options. You have a choice of going to the telephone in addition to the self, as a self-response manner. You can wait for a paper questionnaire. The last thing we don't want people to do is to wait for someone to knock on the door but we're urging everyone to do this before April 1. We're telling them the paper forms will be available 
we're telling folks that non-census ID is okay. You don't have to have an ID to fill, to go online and or call and be included in the census count. We're telling people if you fill out your form, no one will come to your door. And we're telling them to anticipate this information and count suppression. Be aware that there are forces out there that do not want you to be counted. We must tell people that their data is safe over and over and over again and not to cheat their community. And then as a matter of resilience and defiance, we are telling people to stand up and be counted. So um, as I close, um, there's lots to do. There are going to be we can monitor response rates real time, um, probably starting um, in a couple of days. The Census Bureau will have a map up there where you can click on your county and find out how you're doing or your zip, your uh, census track. And we're preparing for non-response follow-up, having some communication and messaging, open the door up. If you must wait that long, here's what you need to do. Um, and lots of outreach, lots of social um, media and so forth. So thank you all so much for inviting me to talk with you all. And um, I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, we do have a question um, from our audience. Um, they ask, uh, census is being sent to our email, correct? How do they, the Census Bureau, get info for every person's email? Do you think you could answer that one for us? Yes, I think I can. You, you will not get an email from this. If you get an email from the Census, uh, it's not from the Census Bureau. They're not, they're going to respond. You, you should be getting a letter in the mail today, March 12th through March 20th. The, the Census Bureau will not email you, so I would ignore that. Um, you will get a letter inviting you to participate where you will get your own unique Census ID that's geocoded to your address so they'll know where this response is coming from and uh, you will get the URL to, to submit your begin completing your census survey. The Census Bureau will not email you. And just as a follow-up for clarification, you don't need an email address to respond to the census, do you? You don't need an email address to respond to the census because there's a telephone option. You can call in your, your responses. But if you're online, um, if you're asking me, do you need an email for them to get back in touch with you? I'm, I, ha I haven't looked at the online form. I've heard things back and forth. Do not take my word for it. So um, I don't believe you need an email address. You, need, you only need to have access to an internet because a lot of people are going to be filling out forms or at, at libraries, at kiosks and such. Um, you just need to have access to a computer. Great. And as you mentioned, today is um, the day that those census letters are going out. So I believe the online portal is set up. So um, you people could go and take a peek at that. Um, even if they're not ready to fill it out quite yet, they could just take a look and see what, uh, what that looks like. And if you go on makeblackcount.org, we have the questionnaire up there. And, a, and we also have uh, a copy of the letter that you will receive in the mailbox between March 12th today and March 20th. Now, I should also say that some people might get, will get, not might, will get a paper form right off the bat. These individuals live in areas that have very, very, had very low response rates in 2010 in the previous census and also have low internet uh, access, low broadband. Um, so some people are actually, a very small part of the population are going to get paper questionnaires in, uh, in addition to the letter. Great. Well, thank you, Jerry. Please stick around um, so that we can do more Q&A at the end of the session. Um, but it is about time for me to introduce our other speaker uh, for this webinar. Um, oh, it looks like you had one more slide, Jerry. Did you want to go over um, this at all? I did talk a little bit about monitoring response rates, I think in the next few days, and you all should do this, especially stakeholders, uh, members of complete count committees, you can 
go on to the census website, there is a response rate map where you can actually see how well your community is doing, how well your neighborhood is doing. And you can see if, if the responses are coming in at a, at a good clip or if they're really, really slow and in, in in self-responding. And that's really an important feature. Um, you know, I did mention that that's what we're gonna be doing, monitoring these rates. We're gonna have conversations with the Census Bureau regarding low response areas. We will have conversations with the Black Caucus. If it looks like uh, um, a city, if Los Angeles or, or some of the other areas where there are large uh, populations, of heart to count populations and they're not responding, we, we're gonna have conversations about what to do. We're not gonna wait till the end of the census and say, oh my goodness, look at that. No, we're gonna try to effect some change, some rapid response to areas that are having low response rates. And I'll leave that, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, I do encourage everyone to check out makeblackcount.org. And as a reminder, if you have questions for Jerry or for our next speaker coming up, you can put those in the question and answer box. And this webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be sent out next week. So now I am going to introduce Adan Chavez, who is the Deputy Director of the National Census Program for the Naleo Educational Fund the nation's leading nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that facilitates full Latino participation in the American political process, from citizenship to public service. Adan plays a key role in supporting the implementation of the organization's national Hagase Kantar and Hazme Kantar campaign, which seek to ensure a full count of the Latino community, including very young Latino children, ages zero to five, in the United States. Most recently, Adan was the regional census campaign manager in the Inland Empire, where he worked with senior leadership, elected officials, and direct service providers to prepare Riverside and San Bernardino counties for a full and accurate count. All right, and with that, Adan, thank you for being here, and I will let you take it away. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin, for that wonderful introduction and for having me. Can everybody hear me? Seems like, yes, great. So like Caitlin mentioned, my name is Azan Chavez and I am the Deputy Director of our National Census Program with the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials or the NALEO Educational Fund for short. And on behalf of NALEO and the NALEO Educational Fund, I want to thank Caitlin Nonprofit Vote for hosting this webinar in preparation for the 2020 Census. And I also want to thank every single nonprofit and nonprofit representative on the line for joining. During this webinar, I'll be sharing a little bit more about our top line findings from our new research study, where we analyze Latino perceptions on the upcoming, or I should say on the now current 2020 census. And I'm gonna share a little bit more about our Agase Contar and Asme Contar campaigns. With Latino decisions, we conducted additional census research. And for this research, we did two things. First, we conducted a national poll that was nationally representative of the adult Latino population in the United States. And this poll included an oversample of undocumented immigrant Latinos, and it also included an oversample of Latinos in the Great Lakes region. We surveyed about a little bit close to 1,300 Latinos between October 8th or 19th in 2019. Second, we also conducted 12 focus groups from late October to mid-December. And here is where we tested messages, perceptions, and plans to participate in the census. These particular focus groups included 96 participants, and we conducted these focus groups in six different locations across Georgia, Florida, Oregon, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Arizona, and across these six different states, we conducted two focus groups, one in English and one in Spanish. Next slide, please. After the end of 2018, we learned that the administration asked to include a question on citizenship on the census 
on the upcoming or current census. And we wanted to understand the impact of the extensive media coverage and conversation on the potential addition of a citizenship question on our community. And that's why we went ahead and oversampled undocumented and immigrant Latinos in both of our samples. And here we found that nearly half of all respondents still expect to see a citizenship question on the census. And this was still after widespread coverage that there in fact will not be a citizenship question on this decennial count. So this is truly a key opportunity or key opportunity for nonprofits. As trusted messengers in your communities, it is important to let others know that there in fact will not be a citizenship question and immigration status will also not be asked about in this upcoming decennial census. After we dig deeper, we can see how complex the situation really is. We can see that 53% of citizens believe there will be a citizenship question but only 40% of non-citizens believe there will be a citizenship question. This to us is an incongruent finding that non-citizens are a little better informed of what is going on to be in the questionnaire than citizens, which really highlights the role of Spanish speaking media and the work that they do to educate our community. Next slide, please. One of the most convincing messages was the message about community empowerment and public benefit. This message actually performed best. This is something that we personally think that there has been a lot of movement in over time from 2018 to 2019. And now that we are at the start of the self-response period, we see that Latinos are feeling that it is important for all of us to be counted. More than 50% of Latinos found the messages of community empowering empowerment, excuse me, very motivated. And that was not the case in 2018. Next slide, please. Messages focus on public benefit were also very convincing. And this was very much consistent over time. You know, when we explain to the public that census data is critical for the distribution of public funds, people understood the connection and it continues to be a very important theme in our messaging and in our work. Next slide, please. Messages about data security are also very much important. In the focus group, once the moderator explained that the census was in fact safe and that there were safeguards to participate, we saw an increased comfort level among focus group participants. Another very key message in this work. Next slide, please. Generally speaking, talking to friends and family about the census is very effective. We saw that personal relationships are an especially trusted source among Latinos. As many participants said that they verify what they read online with friends and family or would also contact them about census related questions. Messages framed around standing up for the Latino community as well as local funding Priorities perform well in both the survey and focus groups. In the survey, we saw that a message about census providing an opportunity for Latinos to stand up and say, quote unquote, we are here and we count, resonated with 88% of respondents. 84% of respondents found a message about census data being used for local funding priorities to be convincing. And across our poster testing in these focus groups, we saw that there was a lot of responsiveness to these messages, which actually influence our artwork and visuals. We also saw that Latino nonprofit organizations like the Naleo Educational Fund and like many of yours, have an especially important role to play as trusted messengers in the census. Across all demographic groups, Latino focused organizations were the most influential messengers on the census. 80% said they would be more likely to participate if they were encouraged by a Latino community organization, with 53, excuse me, 43% of these respondents emphasizing that participation was more likely. And this is definitely the case, especially because of the sensitivities around immigration. Latinos right now are really looking up to these groups for reassurance that the census is both safe and beneficial for our community, 
and that participation is going to be important. Next slide, please. So here is what we found in terms of concerns. On one end, we saw that most Latinos have mixed feelings about participation in the census. While many Latinos, 77% to be exact, understand that their community will benefit if more people participate, 75% of respondents actually also worry that the Trump administration will use this information, any information on the census against him. And 78% of respondents were particularly worried that the census website would be vulnerable to online interference. There is a lot of confusion, which is something else that we found when it comes to answering the question about race on the census form. Many focus group participants left the item blank, while others marked a race category and left the origin detail section blank because they believe they had already answered this question on the prior item that was asked about Hispanic origin. Next slide, please. At Nalil, we're gonna continue to work hard to make sure that we carry out a campaign that's focused on educating, organizing, and mobilizing our Latino participate in Census 2020. We encourage all of our partners to participate in our campaign so that they can take full advantage of our train the trainer workshops, toolkits, all kinds of information and other briefing material. Our work is research informed. We're gonna to continue to make sure all of our messaging is timely, relevant, and effective. Next slide, please. We invite you to check out our campaign website, agasecontar.org. Again, that's agasecontar.org, where you can find all kinds of partner events and even enter your own. You can check out our campaign commitment form to get involved and, com and commit to a full and accurate count of your communities. And in addition, that's where you can find all kinds of downloadable partner resources that are there for your disposable, for, dis for your disposal, excuse me. The idea here is that we want to not have partners feel like they need to recreate the wheel. And we've made all kinds of partner resources downloadable so that partners can plug and play and disseminate these at your events, at your offices, at your public facing engagements, and to the community at large so that they are informed and educated about the importance of census participation. Finally, we also have a direct cell connection to our national bilingual hotline. Next slide, please. Speaking about our hotline, if community members have any questions or concerns, please refer them to our national toll-free census bilingual information and referral hotline. That's 877-EL CENSO, which is 877-352-3676. It's an operation from Monday to Friday, from 8.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we have hotline operators who are trained and ready to answer all of your, uh, to answer all of your questions, whether it be about any work that you're doing or any questions that you're getting from our community members themselves. The hotline is also helpful for you and for many of our community members and other stakeholders so that they can flag any suspicious activity that way we can escalate this suspicious activity with the support of our legal partners so that there is nothing to interfere when it comes to census operations. Next slide, please. We intend to work really closely with school districts and school systems, providing them with curriculum that will complement the Census Bureau statistics and schools work. And we also have developed comprehensive toolkits template presentations and other informational material so that you can make sure and we can all make sure to educate the adults in the lives of young children about the importance of counting kids. To get access to all of these downloadable resources that are tailored specifically to address the undercount of kids, all you have to do is go on asmecontar.org, that's H-A-Z-M-E-C-O-A-N-T-A-R.org. Next slide, please. 
Naleo Educational Fund, in partnership with state and local complete count committees and partners across the country, we've been working and have launched to have launched our Census Ambassador Train the Trainer program, where we have conducted already over 30 trainings across 15 different states in states like California, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Missouri, Nevada, New York, and of course the surrounding New England region, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. You name it, this is probably a state that either we have been to or we're, or we're about to be there. Our goal here is to be able to provide information, education, tools, all kinds of resources to ensure that all of our partners and stakeholders who are serving either dense or emerging Latino communities the technical assistance and support they need to ensure an accurate count of all of their communities in Census 2020. Given the developments around the coronavirus, our remaining trainings will be digital trainings and will be available in webinar form. So to learn more about our digital trainings, please email training at naleo.org. Again, that's training at naleo.org or contact one of our Naleo Educational Fund Regional Census Campaign Managers fielded in a community near you. Next slide, please. There are so many ways to get involved. You know, some of these include distributing information about census jobs, joining our campaign by texting the word census to 9779, if you want to get more information about our campaign in Spanish, then you can text the word CENSO to that same number. We invite all of our partners to promote our bilingual national hotline as a trusted source of information, to of course visit our website, promote our website, and use all of our tools. If you have any questions, we always invite you to email us and keep in touch. My email is a as an apple chavez at aleo.org. And of course, we invite you to follow us on Twitter at Naleo or visit our campaign websites. Thank you again, Caitlin, Nonprofit Vote, and everyone for joining. We are, looking to, we are looking forward to working with each and every one of you to make sure that we have a full and accurate count in Census 2020. Thank you so much, Adan. Um, great presentation. Uh, lots of helpful resources that Naleo has pulled together. And we have some questions from our audience. So I will start uh, posing these. Um, uh, either of you can weigh in, Adan and Jerry, um, uh, because for the most part, these are uh, more general in nature. So the first one, uh, someone was contacted a few weeks ago to be a census worker and filled out an employment application. Was that real or a scam? Jerry, do you want to take this one or should I? Sorry about that. Go ahead, Adon. I'm, I'm, I can follow up or fill in. Okay, perfect. We can definitely tag team. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. So if they were contacted to apply to work for the census, right now the Census Bureau is trying to hire for thousands across the country. And in order to be able to hire, they have also hired and deployed recruitment specialists who are in charge of getting the word out there about Census Bureau jobs. So they either probably attended an event, they either saw a flyer somewhere, or they heard directly from a recruitment specialist. Right, so they are still very much hiring. There's a lot of communities across the country where the Census Bureau is still very much looking to staff up. So the reality is that it is more than likely that this person was contacted by a recruitment specialist. Of course, they can always verify if they were, if this is actually someone from the Census Bureau by simply calling a local regional office or a catch-all Census Bureau number, which I can get to you all after this call. I think that's a great response. Um, the Census Bureau has to recruit 2.5 million people to hire 500,000 enumerators. It's estimated that they're going to need 500,000 enumerators to knock on doors. So the recruitment has been hard and heavy. 
you know, I, I would verify that, you know, especially if someone contacted them online, I would still call that number that um, Adon is going to provide to make sure that it's a legitimate source. So if you got that uh, request online from some random person, please verify before you provide any information. But otherwise, yes, the recruitment has been heavy and it's necessary. Great. All right. The next question, as I had anticipated, is about coronavirus. Um, so very timely. So um, I'll, I'll paraphrase this question. Um, obviously, public health officials have been dissuading public group gatherings, which is why Naleo is uh, switching to virtual training. Um, will there be updates on the preferred method for census taking? Um, which will be more remote or digital versus face-to-face -face. and specifically for individuals that may rely on libraries or nonprofits because they don't have um, internet access or the needed devices. Um, what are the considerations and how can we communicate to these groups on how to safely participate? It's, it's, a, it's a robust one, so you might both want to uh, weigh in. I'm, I'm happy to take a shot um, and, and have my colleague, you know, join in. Um, we're all on the same team, so. Exactly. <laughs> and, mm -hmm, and so we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're together on these things and we're, you know, we're having conversations. Things. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know the Census Bureau, you know, the Census Bureau just put out some guidance. Exactly. Uh, today or, or uh, yesterday, I think, that kind of said, we're monitoring the situation. We may have to ship, ship some operations around, um, you know, and the guidance from a national standpoint, as you all know, we're all, we're, all of us are in this together, um, is, is sketchy. You know, we don't know where the next city is going to have a shutdown, but for our purposes, for all of our purposes, I think we should be concerned about the potential of a governmental shutdown. I know that there are agencies right now and, you know, we're in D.C., so we, you know, lots of people we know work for the federal government and their people are, agencies are considering whether to shut down. So we're, we're wondering if there's, if there's a federal shutdown and the Census Bureau has to do, has to telework, uh, has mandatory teleworking, um, that could slow things down quite a bit. Um, we're worried about the, the potential of a, of a government shutdown and we already have experienced and seeing public events being canceled where there was going to be a Census Bureau present. I think there was a huge rodeo in Houston where there was going to be a big census presence there. It's an annual event that has been going on for decades and that was canceled this weekend. So Census Bureau people had to turn around and go, go back to the Census Bureau. And we're concerned about the impact on non-response follow-up in the black community and in communities of color in general. The non-response follow-up is a huge number of people, and you know, the Census Bureau knows it. So we're concerned. You know, we'll, if this issue isn't addressed, this uh, this this virus, um, will there be a reduction? It's already been hard hiring um, enumerators, getting all those people hired uh, in time. You know, is this going to affect the door knocking process? You know, is there, are there going to be restrictions on? how that process, a very important process takes place. So we're watching all of this mm -hmm. in real time, right now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, thank you so much for, for, thank you so much, Sherry, for that. You know, I think that you hit it right on the dot when it comes to the work that we're all doing to monitor what's going on. So like you mentioned, just yesterday, the Census Bureau released uh, advisory that let us know about, you know, their position, their stance, and their work moving forward in light of the coronavirus situation. So here's a couple of things that we do know so far. One, we know that the Census Bureau is going to push and message that it has never been so convenient to respond and from the comfort of your own home, right? Respondents and households still have the opportunity to go online or jump on the phone in order to avoid contact outside of their home, 
right? So this is a message that we will be pushing at Naleo and we encourage everyone to do the same. And we also right, have questions about the different operations. One particular operation that we're monitoring is how the census will respond during the non-response follow-up period. And we know so far that in cases that have been affected by an outbreak, the, the Census Bureau is thinking through what that may potentially look like. And even though they may have initially planned to conduct non-response follow-up face-to-face in person by knocking on doors, these operations may be pulled back and instead there's going to be a larger telephone operation in order to follow up for households who have not yet responded. In addition to that, we also know that the Census Bureau is going to be setting up these assistance center sites where they're going to pop up for a couple days at a library, school, etc., where there is little to no participation and they'll be monitoring the count in real time. So one of the things we're wondering, right, is what that operation is going to look like. And so the Census Bureau is still very much having discussions on what this can potentially look like. And as soon as we have more information and guidance, then we're happy to share that with Caitlin and, of course, all of you so that everybody is up to date with the operations in real time. Thank you, Adan and Jerry, for that. And I just want to add one thing. Um, earlier this year, we had a webinar with Asian Americans Advancing Justice. And so one thing we can keep in mind as the nonprofit community who are educating people about um, how to participate in the census and also how to um, take care of themselves and prevent the spread of the coronavirus disease, um, we can also remind people that um, just in spite of any fear they may be feeling, um, now is not the time for xenophobia. And exactly. that um, our Asian American and Asian immigrants who live in our communities, who are our neighbors, um, our coworkers, our friends, are particularly susceptible right now to discrimination and violence uh, because, um, and businesses are, are losing money, and so we can do a good job of educating people about what the public health risk is and that, um, you know, hate, hateful behavior um, and discrimination uh, towards Asian Americans, Asian people and their businesses is um, not going to keep them safe. Um, so we can denounce the racism, xenophobia, and misinformation um, surrounding coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to make that one little plug um, uh, before we get into some more of these questions. And uh, you all have been uh, po populating the question box a lot in the last couple minutes. So this is great. So the next one I want to pose, um, Adon, this is specifically, uh, I think, for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to restate the question exactly how it was asked. Uh, this person asked, uh, please explain how Hispanics should answer the race and ethnicity question. This is a great question. So thank you very much for to whoever posed this. We know that the questions around Hispanic origin and race are very confusing for Latinos. This was the case back in 2010 when Latinos were first asked about their Hispanic origin and then they were asked about their race. But for many Latinos, including the ones in my own family, you answer the first question and you already thought you had answered your race. But according to OMB, you know, Hispanic Latino is not an actual race, right? So for the purposes of questions eight and nine on the census questionnaire, we of course want to, just like the Census Bureau, promote self-identification, right? If somebody, say for example, answers question eight, they have the option to answer if they're of Hispanic Latino origin, and they, they have the option to indicate whether they're Mexican, Puerto Rican, another national origin group, and if they don't find themselves identified in one of those three, they have a box to include what national origin groups they do identify with. 
So this is really up to the respondents and how they feel they most identify, they most identify. I will say that for question number eight, if respondents include two different national origin groups, the Census Bureau will look back at the census questionnaire. They'll look back at this particular response from the respondents. And because there are two groups included, the Census Bureau will impute the data and will just decide one national origin group. I know that's unfortunate, but we did want to make everybody mindful of the consequences of when they do include two national origin groups. What the Census Bureau will do, they'll look at the local community and then be able to figure out whether this person might be, say for example, Colombian or Salvadorian if they in fact included that they were Colombian and Salvadorian, right? When it comes to question number nine, this is where we can anticipate additional confusion on this, on this particular census. We had done a lot of research as an organization. The Census Bureau had also done a lot of research and we figured out that the best way to get better and more accurate data from Latinos was to ask a, a combined question. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Even though the Census Bureau agreed, this was one of those questions that got tossed out by the Trump administration in addition to a question about sexual orientation and gender identity that didn't ask about gender in a binary way. And so really here, respondents have the option to identify as either white, black, one of the API groups, I believe another group, and finally some other race if they don't see themselves represented in any of the other options. The best response we can give you all, and this is what we're telling everybody, and this is what we're encouraging everybody to tell everybody else, is that again, it's really up to respondents how they self-identify. We know that this question can be asked better and we hope that this is an area that we change by 2030. But for now, this is one of those questions where we anticipate that as a result, the second largest racial group will be some other race, right? So again, just to wrap all of this up, it is really dependent on how folks self-identify and what they feel is the most relevant option and indicator for them. And then at that point, we are of course encouraging Latino and Hispanic folks to answer number eight, because that is our only real shot to get data about Latinos across the country. Thank you, Adan. All right, this next question, um, I'll ask Jerry to answer. We had a couple people essentially asking, do people need to fill out every question on the form? And what happens if they do not fill out all the questions? Yes, this is Jerry. Okay. Um, yes, it is. It is important and uh, it is required, you know, to fill out every form, every question on, on the questionnaire. If you do not fill out every question, you could get a call back from the Census Bureau asking you to clarify a part of your questionnaire. They do uh, make follow-up calls to get information and you might get a visit to just ask, uh, ask that. But um, so it's not unusual to, to get a call back. And it's also not unusual uh, to skip a question. You know, I, have to, I hate to say it, you wouldn't, you know, as, as my colleague said, the race question is kind of confusing. So, um, you know, some people get a little turned around on that, but the, it is required that you fill out every question. You know, and if you go online, I believe you know, I'm not sure, but if you don't answer a question, I'm not sure if you can proceed with your questionnaire. You might want to kind of check that. You know, you may, you may have to put in a response if you're online or otherwise you won't be able to complete the form. Adon, do you know, uh, can you provide some information on that issue as it relates to the self, uh, the on online uh, form? Of course, my understanding is that the online option does allow folks to leave questions blank, right? But at a certain point, we have gotten guidance from the Bureau that the more and more questions left blank, the more it will trigger a follow-up during the non-response follow-up period. And, 
you know, it is technically, technically, you can be punished by law for every question that you answer incorrectly or any question that you do leave blank, right? And so even though nobody has ever been persecuted for that, prosecuted, excuse me, for that as a result, that is something to know, right? So we, of course, want to encourage everyone to fill out their questionnaire as completely, fully as possible because that's how we can get really good data about our community. And I believe that, sorry, excuse me, every time you do leave a question blank, that might mean that somebody from the census group might conduct some follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are at three o'clock or the, the top of the hour. So um, we're gonna take a couple more questions. Um, the next one, um, Adan, can you answer, somebody asked, is it true that immigration enforcement has been halted during census operation? In other years, there has been a moratorium when it comes to census, sorry, when it comes to immigration enforcement during self-response and non-response follow-up period, those follow-up periods. We haven't heard that that is the case this time around, but we do want to encourage and let our community know about how to spot a Census Bureau staffer. We know that they will be carrying a, a ID issued by the Department of Commerce, and they're also going to be carrying a portfolio with the U.S. Census Bureau branding. It's important to note that because, you know, we want our community to be informed and prepared and be able to identify that this is in fact someone from the Census Bureau and this is not on the other end, someone impersonating the Census Bureau to try to obtain information from them. A couple things to keep in mind, the Census Bureau will never ask to enter people's home and the Census Bureau will never ask for additional documentation your bank account information, and they will also never ask about your immigration status or citizenship status. So if at any point folks feel that they might be subject to either fraud or someone might be trying to take their identity in one way or the other, then we encourage folks to call our 877 El Censo hotline so that we can flag th these instances and that way we can also provide our community members with the appropriate help. Great. And are census forms delivered in Spanish or other languages? And how do they know who needs what language? So my colleague earlier mentioned that in most cases, folks will get an invitation to participate and go online. These are cases where the Census Bureau anticipates that these particular households, these particular tracts, will not have a hard time jump, jumping on the internet and accessing their online form. But in some cases, we know that we know that in the first mailing, some households will receive a paper questionnaire. So the way that this is going to happen is that about 80% of households will be asked to respond to the internet first option, where they will be encouraged to go online. But in 20% of instances, they will be asked to respond to the internet choice option where they do have the choice to go online if they so please, but they will also get a paper questionnaire. We know that across the country, some tracks will be getting paper questionnaires in both English and Spanish, and all of their invitations, all of their materials will also be available in bilingual forms. I believe that's the case across 13 million households in about 40 different states across the country. If you want to know how your community is going to be asked to respond, you can easily check if they're gonna receive a paper invitation, bilingual questionnaire materials, or an internet invitation by going to the college and universities hard to count map, which is already live. You can actually see by track level how different folks are gonna be asked to participate. And even if they don't receive a, a Spanish, sorry, a bilingual questionnaire and invitation, then they're, they're still able to respond in Spanish through the phone assistance option. 
and they can also translate their online questionnaire to Spanish once they do go online and respond. So there's a bunch of different language options to make language accessibility a priority so that everybody can have access to their sense questionnaire in their preferred language. Great, thank you. Uh, now, Jerry, um, a, we have a black college student asking if there are um, Urban League resources in particular that can be used to speak to other black classmates about census awareness. And Jerry, if you're talking, you might be on mute right now. <laughs> There I am. Perfect. So glad I got back in. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, the, the Urban League, <laughs> there, there are some materials up there. We're getting ready to put something up for college students in particular. But you can follow up. We'll follow up. I'll give my contact information to, to Caitlin, and we, you can call, contact me directly. Um, there's going to be a, a Congressman Horsford is inviting uh, if he's having a special webinar for colleges, college students on um, the 2020 census, I'd like to provide some follow-up information to you on that. With the black, Great. so okay. so I'll give you my you, you can share my contact information, Caitlin, and anyone who wants to email me about information, I'm happy to respond. Great, and we just had one last question, um, so. Do either of you know if there are any resources or a toolkit that explains why the questions being asked on the census are there? And tools or resources to reference would be great. Yeah, actually, so there is a, so Jerry and I belong to this national group of hub organizations who are making all kinds of resources, toolkits available for all kinds of hard to count communities all kinds of organizations and stakeholders who work across different issue areas across the country for different communities. And if folks go on censuscounts.org, our different partners have issued when it comes to questions, right? So for example, the question about sex, our partners over at the National LGBT Task Force have issued guidance and a brief on why they ask about sex and the consequences of not answering, right? So you can find very similar content at censuscounts.org that can provide you more detailed content of why it is they ask particular questions. And also um, the, um, the toolkit that the, that the National Urban League put together, which I'll email to you, Caitlin, I believe um, there is a section for in there that goes through each question and why it's asked. I'm pretty sure because I wrote I wrote it. So I'm like, I think I put that in our toolkit. So I'll send that toolkit. I'll email that to you right after we talk. And I do believe it's it's also online at uh, makeblackcount.org. All right. Well, thank you so much to Jerry Green and Adan Chavez for. Um, being on this webinar and sharing this incredible information. Thank you to your organizations, National Urban League and Naleo Educational Fund for putting so many resources and really investing in uh, the census and making sure our communities are fully counted. This was really helpful information for me and hopefully everyone else on the webinar. Um, once again, we'll be sending out this recording and slides. We'll also have a registration link for our next webinar on the census, which will be April 8th. And so by then, you know, the census will be well underway. So we can talk about those tools, about seeing how your community is responding and what's working and what still needs to be done to ensure a full count, because we know it impacts the next 10 years very directly. And really, it will impact, um, it will impact our whole lifetime. So thank you to both of you. Thank you to all our attendees, those who asked such thoughtful questions. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, stay healthy 
and we will see you again next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Don't forget to self-respond and sanitize. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Don. Bye, Jerry. Good to talk to you. Have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Caitlin.